Good morning. It is so good to be with you. So good to, to be together, to encourage one another and to glorify our God who is certainly worthy. The title certainly looks like the title of a sermon of a preacher who has just been fired. Yes? Or maybe a preacher who's thinking of resigning. Well, I can tell you that neither of those are true. At least I haven't been informed of the first and I have no intention of the second. Um, but no, the, the purpose of the title is to hopefully gain your attention. And the purpose behind the message is because I love you so much and all Christians and my great desire it's the same desire of our good and glorious God that all of you would be saved and make it to heaven. Because the problem is, we humans are exceedingly good at twisting the truth. Peter warmed of that in our study. Second Peter chapter 3, he talked about those people that, that take some of the writings of Paul, some things which are hard to understand, and they twist that truth to their own destruction as they do also the rest of Scripture. And we can do that too. We jokingly talk about how children are so good at that. I mean, we started at the youngest of ages, right? You know, go clean your room. And five seconds later, your child comes out and you're just shaking your head going, do you think I was born yesterday? I know your room's not clean. Come look. But don't look under the bed or in the closet. Because we know what happened. Well, did they not understand what I meant when I said go clean your room? Of course they understood. But they twisted it to suit their desires. And we often do that ourselves. And we have to be on guard. Think about the fact that we know that grace, the grace of God, has been poured out on all flesh. That grace, salvation, is full and free. And yet... Some people seem to act like grace is cheap. Some people seem to think that, yes, Jesus paid it all. And Jesus gave it all. That's true. How can we think that he would expect anything less from us? And yet, people will sing that song, Jesus paid it all. I'm done then. Thank you, Jesus. I can go about living my life. Well, how can they do such things with all the commandments? Because they are twisted to, ser to uh, serve our own needs. And again, I would have you all be saved. I would have myself be saved and make it and go to heaven. And so, because of that, this morning I want to talk about four false doctrines in my Somewhat limited, but it's actually getting on. I'm coming up on 19 years as a Christian. Um, not so much a new Christian. Time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping. So coming up on 19 years, and in that short time compared to some, I have noticed some of these false doctrines. And we're going to talk about four of them. And again, these are false doctrines that are in the church that would never be declared as a doctrine but I have seen them lived as a doctrine. Okay? Let us begin. The first one I want to talk about is the false doctrine that salvation is genealogical. That is, it runs in families. Okay? Now, like all false doctrines, there's a degree of truth there, isn't there? In general... Christian parents will raise their children in the training and admonition of the Lord, right? If they're in it to win it, Christians, that's what they're going to do. And their children are thus prepared and have a better chance for salvation. It's not assured. You know that Proverbs 22, verse 6. Remember, it's proverbial. In general, if you train up a child in the way that they should go, they will not depart from it. In general, that's true. But it's not always true. We have free will. So there's a, there's a sense in which 
salvation runs through families because if you have Christian parents, there's a good chance you're going to be a Christian, but not necessarily. And I praise God and my wife praises God that though we weren't raised in Christian families, we found salvation, all right? So this mindset has always been a problem for mankind. Israel struggled with this idea, right? They are the chosen people of God. And we all say amen, right? But what's the second thing we got to say? Chosen for what purpose? Chosen because they were better than everybody else? Read Deuteronomy 7 and Deuteronomy 9. God goes out of his way and <laughs> our God is so good and so loving. But boy, does he bring the whooping when it has to come, doesn't he? Because in those two chapters, he talks about the fact that Israel, don't think in your heart that I chose you because you were more righteous than the rest of the nations, for you are not. You are a stiff-necked people. Don't think I chose you because you're more numerous than all the other nations, because you were the fewest, you're the, the smallest of all nations. No, I chose you because I made promises to the fathers, right? He'd made a promise to Adam and Eve in the garden, and that promise was focused in Abraham, and that's who the Jews were. The focusing of that promise, the bringing of the Christ, the promised Messiah, into the world. So yes, they were chosen for that purpose. And yet, Israel, how often did they think it was all about them? That they were somehow special and saved no matter what they did. Micah chapter 6, they turn to God and they say, what's the problem, God? Why aren't you taking care of us? What do you want? You want some more money? You want some more sacrifices? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, same thing. Why aren't you taking care of us? And God basically said, it's not because I don't know, and it's not because I can't. It's because you're in your sin, and I will not hear you, and I will not help you. Even in the days of Jesus, in Luke chapter 13, it's one of my favorite passages, says the preacher about almost every passage, but in verse 23, Jesus is talking to a crowd, and there's a man in the crowd who stands up and says, wait a minute, are you saying that there are just a few who will be saved? What's behind that question, church? He's like, hey, we're all Jews here. What's the big deal? We're all saved, aren't we? But he had listened to Jesus enough that he was starting to sense, wait a minute, are you saying that not all Jews are saved, that actually just a few are? You remember how Jesus answered in verse 24? Strive to enter, because many will try but be unable. It's not hereditary. <laughs> I thought of this joke, and you've got to forgive me, okay? We are not saved by our genes, G-E-N-E-S. But my children were definitely saved by their gene, J-E-A-N-N-E. -N -N -E. uh, and I helped too. If you don't understand that, ask me afterwards, I'll explain it. So it's not genealogical. Uh, Paul wrote in the New Testament uh, to the church against this false belief over and over and over and over. Romans 9 and verse 6, not all Israel are Israel. What does that mean? Well, all the people who can show their lineage from Abraham aren't going to be saved. Not going to be that spiritual Israel. All the physical Israel is not spiritual Israel. Chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, what did he say? A Jew is not one outwardly, but one inwardly. What are you talking about? I wear the clothes, I got the hair, I've been circumcised. I eat the food, I don't eat the food, I drink the stuff, I don't drink the stuff. I am a Jew. No, no. A Jew is about the heart. That's why Paul in Galatians uh, chapter 6 could say to the church, the Israel of God. Well, that would have been a surprise to people who thought it was genetic. Galatians 3 and verse 9 and verse 29. Who are the heirs of Abraham? All people who are Israel. No, 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 no. Those who are of faith are the heirs, even people who are not genetically and physically related to Abraham. They are the true heirs. It's not genealogical. Ephesians 1 and 5, we talked about that fact, that there's an adoption. It's not about physical connection. It's an, about an adoption according to a set of terms. Okay, well, Israel had a problem with that. The early church had a problem with that. 
what about us today? Well, again, it's probably not something we'd ever say, but I've seen it. I've heard it. I've been to churches where I said, tell me your story. Why are you here this morning with the assembly of God? Well, my grandfather was an elder. Okay. Why are you here? Well, my great-grandfather was a preacher in this area. You haven't answered my question yet. Why are you here? It's a subtle thing. The idea that, that our children somehow are miraculously going to be saved and we don't have to put in the hard work. Or, it's up to the church to raise my children spiritually. Don't tell me you haven't seen that. That is not the reality. We are not saved by genetics. The truth is laid out painfully clear. Jesus said, you want to go where I'm going? I'm going back to the Father. Do you want to go to the Father? Here's what you do. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Ezekiel wrote this, talking to the house of Israel. One of my favorite passages. I guess I have two favorite passages today. Yet the house of Israel says the way of the Lord is not fair. What's in response to? He said, if a man is wicked, but he repents and becomes righteous, I will deem him righteous. But if a righteous man starts to act wickedly, I'm going to consider him wicked. Is that not fair? And Israel says, no. I just want to be saved, period. Oh, house of Israel, is it not my ways which are fair and your ways which are not fair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways. Not his mamas, not his daddies, not his grandpas, not his great grandpa, not his uh, uncle three times removed, if such a thing exists. Repent, turn, and turn, said it twice, from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit for why should you die O house of Israel there's no reason for any person to be lost God has paid the price but you must access that grace by faith why should anyone die for I God have no pleasure in the death of one who dies therefore turn and live we talked about this morning in our Bible class. Save yourself. But it's up to you. Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, talking about the great judgment scene. And what is the criteria for judgment? According to their works. Not who their family was. Not who they affiliated with. Their works. Salvation is not genealogical. If it's to be, it's up to me. The second false doctrine. Once saved, always saved. Oh, Rick, we of course know that that's not true. We've heard so many lessons. You could probably all give me a better lesson than I'm about to give you to refute this clearly false doctrine. Once saved, always saved. But Galatians 5 and verse 4 says, You have become estranged from Christ. You have fallen from grace. That's enough said. It's not enough said. Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, Christians. And then what do they do? They fell away. They lied to the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer, he fell away. False teachers say, then he must have never really believed. Well, he fooled the Holy Spirit who documented earlier in the chapter that he believed and was baptized. And not just that. He was in it to win it. He was following Philip around in his ministry. Guess what he did? He fell away. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. Paul warned the church in Thessalonica about the great falling away that was going to happen. What a foolish thing for Paul to do since you cannot fall away. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 20. Paul talked to Timothy about Hamenaeus and Alexander people he had turned over to Satan. Well, why, how? 
Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, we're going to be there in a couple of weeks. What's the whole purpose of the Hebrews author writing? Don't turn away from Christ. Don't fall away. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some. No. Revelation 2.10. Be faithful unto death. Well, if it's once saved, always saved. What a ridiculous statement to find in the Bible. So, obviously, that's not true. But, but what about Christians today? Do, do any of them hold on to this? I sure seem to see it at times. I hear about a lot of things that were done in the past. I hear about a lot of things that they believed and they pursued in the past, but then I don't see it sometimes. Whereas, turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, please. I've mentioned it a lot. I usually go right to verse 12, but look at the whole context of it. Finally then, brethren... We urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ that you should what? Abound more and more. Just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. We told you what it meant to be Christian. And you're supposed to be abounding more and more every day. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, Christ-likeness that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel, his body, in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Now, concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all of Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands as we have commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, that you may lack nothing. There's a game plan. There's a process where to be about, more and more like Christ. Think of that 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Constantly growing in Christ. Constantly. Because if something is not growing, I have a garden going on right now. Right now, or last week, my cucumbers stopped growing so much. You know what that means that they're doing? They're dying. That's what happens. Christians, if we're not constantly growing, we're dying. In the great words of Chuck Gordon, football coach, you either get better or you get worse. That's the only two options. No staying the same. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. Christians, you're either closer to Christ or you're farther. That's the reality. Consider Ephesians 5, verses 14 through 18. Who's Paul writing to? Christians. And he says, therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, applying this to Christians, arise from the dead. He's writing to Christians. And Christ will give you light. See then, since that's Christ's attitude, see then that you walk, live circumspectly, minding your way. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise. Look at that, circumspectly, wise versus unwise. But understand what the will of the Lord is. Did your ears perk up? What's the will of the Lord? Uh, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, it was our sanctification. Here's how he describes it here in the Ephesian letter. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Remember this morning's Bible class? Sometimes we got to get into that Greek language. There's a reason that's how the New Testament was delivered. It's a very specific language. That filled word 
It is present tense imperative. What does that mean? We're all Greek scholars after this morning's Bible class. Continuing action. Continue to be filled. Wait a minute. If I'm filled, how can I be filled more? Because it's not a closed system. Keep expanding. You don't believe me? Look at my belly. I keep eating. It can just keep expanding. Okay? So fill up your spiritual bellies and keep on filling yourself with the Spirit, not the things of the world, which are truly passing away. So, obvious false doctrine, yet sometimes, sometimes brethren get the idea that they can retire from Jesus. Justin and I talked about this last night a bit, or yesterday. When I first became a Christian, my first work, as you know, was in Jamestown, New York. And the church in the north is exceedingly weak. Very few churches have elders there. And then I would come back to go to my school of preaching uh, lectureship, which I enjoyed so much. And here I am at a congregation that has 450 members. And in that congregation, there were about five retired preachers who are not disabled. And I'm up in New York trying to find any man that can stand in the gap to help me with my work. And I'm saying, what are you guys doing? You, you don't want to preach anymore. How about be an elder in a church in the north that needs good, godly men who know the truth? Well, you know, I got a boat and I like to fish. I like hanging out with my grandchildren. Amen. But what about service to the Lord? Good thing I don't talk about that anymore, huh? We're never done. Never done. When did Jesus quit? Next false doctrine. Salvation is by baptism alone. Well, faith only is obviously a false doctrine. What about baptism alone? Well, who would ever say that? Oh, brethren, I hear it a lot. I think it's an example of parasympathetic overshoot. Don't you agree? Uh, in physiology, we, we, have, we have these things called nerves, right? <laughs> and, and we have these receptors between nerves, and messages get sent back and forth, and our body is regulated by a system of dynamic equilibrium, always changing, but always staying just about the same, okay? Um, here's an example. Maybe you've seen this. Someone gets very scared, very frightened, okay? And then... Five minutes later, they're giggling uncontrollably and crying. Have you ever seen anything like that? And we say, they're hysterical. No, what's happened is, on that chemical uh, level, they were so filled with epinephrine, the fight and flight thing, that now the body is trying to reduce that, and it overcompensates. So that it goes from being over here to being way over here. Uncontrollable laughter, because they're terrified. Okay, that's parasympathetic, that's the nervous system that's being affected, overshoot, it goes too far, all right? What do we in the church contend with? Baptism is a work, you don't need to be baptized to be saved, but it says like a million times, nope, you don't have to do it, so what do we do? We make it such a thing that it sounds like we are water dogs, like they call us. All you got to do is get somebody baptized. There are people that like to travel to other places because in certain places in this world, I can get 100 people to get baptized and it's no big deal. Not that I've saved 100 souls, but I had 100 people listen to me and say, what, it'd be good for me to let you dunk me underwater and, and then I'm a better person? Sure, go ahead. Did I save them? I'm sure you've seen it in the church. There are times when, I'm sure, good intention, brethren, bum rush people into the waters. You ever see somebody get bum rushed into the water? Where a preacher gets up there, or maybe a visiting speaker, and he just tries to put the fear of God in him. And then we read, you know, just as I am, we sing that song. And then he says, sing it again. Why? Because nobody came forward yet, and I'm not leaving till I get one. We're going to keep singing until somebody comes forward. I've seen a, 
an older woman sit there and a visiting preacher came and sat with her and he just scared her into that water with no concept of what it was all she was going to actually have to make the changes in her life. Got her baptized, good to go, and then he left town. No. You ever talk to somebody and you say, what about so-and-so? They used to, they used to attend and I, I haven't seen them in forever. And I, oh, they were baptized though. What does that mean? It means it's worse for them now than it was before. Like Peter said, right? Because having come to God and, and, and been washed and then to return to the mire, that's worse than if they had never come. And yet some people seem to think like that's a get out of, get out of hell free card. They were baptized. Did they continue faithful unto death? Do you remember Ananias and Sapphira? They were baptized. Do you remember Simon? He was baptized. Why did Paul, after founding all these churches and getting all these people baptized, come back through the area and say, you've got to continue in the faith? Well, if they were baptized, done. No. Baptism is an incredibly important part of our salvation, but it is but one part. It is the day we are born. Then what? Sanctification. Abounding more, more and more. Last one. God accepts all worship. Rick, I know that's not true. We've refuted that. I mean, you can look at that. Genesis chapter 4, God rejected Cain's worship. In uh, Leviticus 10, Nadab and Abihu, uh, he struck the boys dead in front of their daddy and told their daddy not to cry about it. Why? False worship. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, Jeroboam started instituting worshiping God, but doing it incorrectly. God first thing sent a prophet, and then a curse. Matthew 15 and verse 9, Jesus, quoting from Isaiah 29, 13, said, You worship me in vain. You come to me with your lips, but you're not worshiping me truly. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 10. Do you remember what God said? He said, why are you in my temple? What's with all the incense and all the sacrifices? You're making me sick with it. You commanded us to do this. Yeah, but you're not doing it with your heart. You're going through the motions. And then Malachi, right, the other end of the spectrum, uh, some 300 and some years later, Malachi chapter 1, what does God say again? Well, I'll read it to you. Verse 10, who is there even among you who would shut the doors? Talking about the temple. So that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of God, Lord of hosts, nor will I accept any offering from your hands. What's that about? Well, read the previous part. They despised this. They said it was, a, oh, it's so burdensome. Oh, it's so weird. Oh, I got to go to church. Oh, I got to give an offering. Oh, I got to, that's how they were acting. And God says, somebody please just shut it. He does not accept all forms of worship. Okay, but what does that have to do with the Lord's church, Rick? We do worship right. That sounds like it should be a commercial or something, right? We do chicken right? We do, what, what's that commercial? Anyways, um, there is one. I'll, I'll remember it. We sit back and we go, hey, there's no piano. There's no choir. No priestly vestments. No woman preacher. No tithing going on. No icons. We do worship right. There are many things that we don't do, these things, that we should not do. But what about the worship we are commanded to give in spirit and in truth? I'm afraid I've seen so many brethren that believe the false doctrine that God will accept whatever they give. I told you about a brother. He called himself a brother in Jamestown, New York, who came in every morning for worship, never Bible class, just worship. And really, he only came to take the Lord's Supper. And he sat right here in the front row, and he opened his briefcase, and he did his work, secular work, the whole service. 
but he partook of his cracker and he drank his juice. And to him, worship. I mean, that's obviously extreme, but I've told you that in Jamestown, we had benches instead of chairs, two, they could fit two people on both sides. And uh, here's a little PSA. I think it'd be good for elders to be sitting up here. It's kind of weird when I'm walking around in front of them, but um, because why are these called elders benches or elders chairs? Because the elders used to sit here. And you know what they did? They watched you. Why? Because they're shepherds watching out for the sheep. And I can tell you that I was the last person to sit down on that bench in Jamestown. Everything else was done beforehand. I partook of the Lord's Supper up here, and guess what I got to see? I got to see people playing and messing around during the Lord's Supper. I got to see people not singing. I got to see people doing watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. When the singing was going on, watermelon is a thing you say that makes it look like your lips are moving to the song. We're getting ready to sing a song before we partake of the offering, the supper. And I see people that aren't even singing, that are messing around. Not here, there. I can't see you here. And when we're partaking of the Lord's Supper, I'm watching people just mess around. And it would just rip my guts out. There were several times when I'd get up to preach, and the first thing I'd have to do is, let's go to our God in prayer. Because I was so messed up by all of that. Because they thought all they had to do was show up. And that was worship. They would never say it. But that's the reality. Thank the Lord. Nothing like that occurs here. Brethren, we are allowed to pray. We should be praying fervently. We are allowed to draw near to the throne of the Creator God and to sing to Him. This is the God that created you. This is the God that sent his son to die for you. This is the God that blesses you and holds heaven in your hands. And how are you singing to him? Holy, holy, holy. Oh really? If someone saved your life, are you going to say, hey, thanks, appreciate that? Shouldn't we be singing out from our heart? Shouldn't we have tears in our eyes when we consider those words and what they mean and their significance? In spirit and in truth. And here's the truth part. It says to sing in spirit. So if you're not doing that, you're not doing the truth. Enough of that. Therefore, there are false doctrines we can inadvertently maybe, begin to believe and to live, though we'd never profess them. Jesus in Mark 7 verse 13 talked about that practice of Corban, where the Jews had figured out a way that they wouldn't have to take care of their mom and dad. If they gave their money to the temple, they could tell their mom and dad, sorry, I gave it the office. I can give you nothing. And Jesus said, you're taking the, the, the commandments of men to violate the commands of God. And you do many such things like that. Do we? 1 Timothy 4, 15 through 16. This is what we ought to be doing. Meditate on these things. These are the things he's talking about. Meditate, what does that mean? Picture a cow chewing its cud. We're just always reading and thinking and considering and implementing. Give yourself entirely to them. I wonder what that could mean. Why is he so vague? Give yourself entirely so that your progress may be evident to all. That's how we encourage one another. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue, not one and done, continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Isn't that a worthy goal? Balcony gives me an amen. Brethren, be careful of the doctrine that you live, not just the one you profess. This morning, if you are not a Christian, if you have never taken God up on his offer, 
to wash your sins away in the waters of baptism, why not this morning? If you don't understand, please talk to somebody. If you're just beginning to, to look into this, ask somebody here to help you with that study. If you do understand, do you really understand that there may be tomorrow, no tomorrow, that judgment is a certainty and that the criterion is clearly revealed? Why not this morning? Christians, don't get distracted. Don't buy in to what the world promises, what false teachers promise, what that voice in the back of your head speaking for your desires promises. Listen to God. Follow Him. It is the only way. If there's anything we can do to help, we'd ask that you come as together we stand and sing.